Welcome back to part four of our series, Building the App MVC Couch. Tutorial 4.4, we're going to focus on the V part of the MVC pattern. So we're going to talk about setting up our views. We're also going to go back and look at our controller logic, and we're going to scan through quite a bit of implementation code between all these source code files. So we have a lot to cover and just a limited time to get it covered in. So let's go ahead and dig right in. What is a view? Well, basically, a view is just a graphical component that the end user interacts with in your application. We have several views in NBC Couch. Before we review the source code for those views, I wanted to show you another class that's necessary in order for NBC Couch to work correctly. Uh, if we go into our app subfolder and go into our view subfolder, you'll notice I have a class here named viewport.js. The purpose of this class is simply to define a viewport that will house our remaining view classes. I found that this was necessary when you're using ehtjs4's dynamic loading feature. Now let's go ahead and discuss our actual view classes. They're found in this user subfolder, and we have four, as I mentioned. Two of these are forms, doc edit and user edit, and the other two are grids, list and detail. So let's first look at our form classes. MVC Couch's form classes are almost identical to the form class defined in the MVC architecture guide. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I did want to highlight a couple of things that, that are different. And one obvious difference is that we, of course, changed our class names. We also changed in our items array the field names and field labels to correspond with the proper grid. So here we're looking at our doc edit class, and if we go back to our GUI, the doc edit class corresponds with this doc edit form. And likewise, this user edit form here in the graphical user interface corresponds with our user edit class. The field names and field labels in our user edit class correspond with that form. So other than that, both of these form views are identical to the form that's used in the MVC architecture guide. There is one thing I do want to show you, though, because both of these forms have buttons. just want to show you the relationship of the save button in our controller class. So as you can see, we're defining an action here called save. And if you go to our users.js, which is our controller, you slide down to where we set up the control function. We have both a doc edit button here with the action save and a user edit button with the action save defined here. Both buttons run this update user function. To actually look at the function, you can scroll down in the controller here, and here we see update user. And this update user function is almost identical to the one in the MVC architecture guide as well, except for this last line of code right here. And all this line of code does is synchronize two stores so that our detail grid will show whatever updates were reflected in the form. So that's about all I want to show you with the, the form views. Let's now talk about our more complex grid views. First we have user list, which corresponds with this top grid, and then detail list, which corresponds with this bottom uh, grid view. Taking a look at the source code for list.js, you see we're defining user.list as a grid panel. We're assigning the user's store to this grid panel. And we're uh, labeling all of the columns and so forth, just like in the MVC architecture guide. But you'll notice we've added a toolbar and an add and delete button to our grid. That's what's defined here. And along with the toolbars and buttons, we've assigned some extra functions that are called when those buttons are clicked. And this is true of both our list grid and also our detail grid. So that's standard setup. We don't need to get into too much detail there. So let's get back to our list grid and talk about some of this implementation code that uh, goes along with clicking these buttons. The add button has this event handler configured so that when the button is pressed, we run this on add click function. And that function is defined down here. So what happens when we click this button and run this function? Well, we're actually going to send a post request to CouchDB and have CouchDB create a new document for us. 
So first, using the model manager, we create a new instance of our doc model. Here, we insert it into our user's store. Then we synchronize the store, which will use our doc model's proxy to talk to CouchDB. CouchDB will automatically add a new document with its unique ID and rev fields. And then when we do this store.load, our application will trigger CouchDB's view to show us the latest changes in the database, which includes our new document, and we'll see it in our grid. We also have a delete button configured. And this also has a handler defined. And this handler, when the button is clicked, will run this function on delete click. So what happens when we press that button and run this on delete click function? We will delete a CouchDB document from the database. We do this by sending an HTTP delete request to CouchDB. Before the delete request is made, we allow the end user to confirm whether or not they want to delete the document. If they don't want to, then they can uh, bail out and this message alert is shown. Otherwise, if they click yes in the confirmation form, then this function will run, process result. So what happens here? CouchDB requires that when you send a delete request, you attach as a parameter the revision of the document you want to delete. We have to grab that document's value of its revision field and apply it as an extra param on our proxy config. So that's what we're doing here. We're adding a rev param to our URL, and then we're stepping the value of the rev variable we just created. Doing a store.sync will perform the actual delete request, and then immediately after we delete the document, we want to destroy this extra params configuration because it will affect other HTTP requests that we might want to do immediately after. For example, immediately after we do the delete, we're going to run this store.load again to see in our application the changes made to the database, and we do not want to attach the rev ID to a get request. So we go ahead and destroy it before we do our store.load. Our list grid also does some other things. You notice we define a another listener here on selection change. That's for this function here. When we change selections, the delete button goes from a disabled state to an enabled state. And we also define a button in our grid here named sync selected document. It is assigned this save doc action, which we'll talk about when we look at our uh, implementation code back in our users.js controller. You may be wondering when we switch different rows in this grid view, the lower grid updates with the correct records. So how do we do that in our implementation code? That functionality is defined in our controller, users.js, where we configured some event listeners to our user list viewport, or our list grid. And you see those event listeners here. Now, when an end user clicks on different rows in the user list grid, it's going to trigger the selection change event. And that event triggers the clear details function that we see here. Really, all this clear details function does is uh, deletes any and all records in the details store. So it's always flushed clean before we dynamically load records by triggering the item click event and running the show user function. When a user clicks a row in the grid, the item click event also fires and runs the show user function. And this function is the main focus of our implementation code. So let's spend some time discussing what it does. First of all, we need to get the index of the selected row in the grid and use that index to select the corresponding record in the user's store. So that's what we're doing with this line of code. Next, we need to create a global variable named doc instance and stuff that variable with the value of the selected record from the user's store. Now, since doc instance has nested JSON associated with it, ext.js4 will let us create a temporary store to hold those nested JSON records using a built-in function from their model class. We call doc instant.members, which is a variation of the model name, and stuff those records in another global variable we define as users instance. That's what this line of code does.
if user's instance already has data in it, we will load our detail store with the data in the user's instance store. Otherwise, we will add a blank record to our detail store using the model manager. These lines of code show us creating a new model instance based on the member model and then adding it to the detail store. Finally, whatever changes we make to the detail store, we also want to make to our global variable users instance and vice versa. If we make a change to users instance, we also want to reflect those changes in our detail store. This keeps both of our stores in sync. And that's what this last line of code is doing in our show users function. So this is just one technique that we use to get data to show up in our detail grid using our details store that originates from data in our users store and is seen in our list grid. Our last view is our users detail grid panel that we see defined here. And you see we're requiring ext.toolbar.text item. You'll also see that we're using the details store to store data in this grid. We're configuring our columns to use the proper column names and fields. We're applying a toolbar and a couple of toolbar items, the add and delete button. And just like our list grid, both of those buttons have event handlers assigned to them. So let's look at what those do. When a user clicks the Add button and runs the OnAddClick function, we're going to create another global variable named UserAd and stuff it with a new member model instance that we create using the model manager. Then we're going to insert that model instance into the details store, and we're also going to add it to the global variable users instance to keep it in sync. In a similar fashion, when the user clicks the delete button and runs the on delete click function, we're going to create a global variable named user delete and stuff it with the selected detail store record that corresponds with the selected row in that grid. And if user delete has data in it, then the function will continue to go ahead and remove that selected record from the detail store. Now you may remember from our previous tutorial that we had to find some listeners in the details store. So let's take a quick look at those. You'll see we've added these load, add, and remove event listeners. When the details store is loaded, the load event is triggered. And it's going to run a function that will fetch the current value of records stored in the user details global variable and stuff it in this store. Next, we set the add listener so that whenever a record is added to the details store, it will set the global variables user add and doc instance to dirty. Setting these records as dirty will alert ext.js to write document changes back to CouchDB whenever we call a store.sync on our users or our details store. We're doing something similar with the remove listener and we're going ahead and just removing from the user's instance whatever record is currently in the user delete global variable. Now getting back to our detailed grid view, we've defined a button on this grid and assigned the save doc action to that button. So what do these buttons do and what does the save doc action do? Well, what it does is defined in our controller class. We've assigned the action save doc to both of those buttons, and when those buttons are clicked, it's going to run the update doc function. So what does that do? The first thing the update doc function does is it alerts the end user that only the selected document in the list grid will be saved. Next, it calls store.sync on the user's store, which will then use its proxy to make a put request to CouchDB. It then calls store.load on the user store, which will again use its proxy, but this time to make a get request to CouchDB. And this action will automatically update CouchDB's view, which we will then load into our user store. Next, the function flushes the details store clean. And finally, it alerts the end user that the selected document has been saved. So that pretty much covers our discussion of all the implementation code that we're using in all of our view classes and also in our controller class. So that pretty much wraps up tutorial 4.4.
Our next tutorial will be a little bit easier. We're going to focus on how to create the CouchDB view function that we use to read in data into our application MVC Couch. So I look forward to seeing you then. Have a great day.